Good evening, and welcome to Narnia by the Fire, as we read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis, with permission from HarperCollins Children's Books. Our reading will last the next half hour. Now, let's step into the wardrobe. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining me again as we read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. Now, this evening, we're going to be reading chapters 11 and 12. And you'll remember the children and the beavers have just met Father Christmas and they're heading their way to the stone table. So let's find out what happens next. Chapter 11. Aslan is nearer. Edmund, meanwhile, had been having the most disappointing time. When the dwarf had gone to get the sledge ready, he expected that the witch would start being nice to him, as she had been when they last met. But she said nothing at all. And when at last Edmund plucked his courage to say, Please, your majesty, could I have some Turkish delight? You, you said, you said that... She answered, Silence, fool! And then she appeared to change her mind and said, as if for herself, and, and, and yet it will not do to have their brat fainting on the way. So she clapped her hands once more and another dwarf appeared. Bring the human creature some food and drink, she said. The dwarf went away and then returned to bring in an iron bowl with some water in it and an iron plate with a hunk of dry bread on it. He grinned in a repulsive manner and he set them down on the floor beside Edmund and said, Turkish delight for the little prince. <laughs> Take it away, Edmund said sulkily. I don't want dry bread. But the witch suddenly turned on him with such a terrible expression on her face that he apologised and began to nibble on the bread that it was so stale he could hardly get it down. You may be glad enough to have this before you taste bread again, said the witch. And while he was still chewing away, the first dwarf came back and announced that the sledge was ready. The white, the white witch rose and went out, ordering Edmund to go with her. The snow was again falling as they came into the courtyard, but she took no notice of that and made Edmund sit beside her on the sledge. And before they drove off, she called Morgrim, and he came bounding like an enormous dog to sit on the side of the sledge. Take with you your swiftest wolves and go at once to the house of the beavers, said the witch, and kill whatever you find there. If they are already gone, then make all speed to the stone table. But do not be seen. Wait for me there in hiding. I, meanwhile, must go many miles to the west before I find a place where I can drive across the river. You may overtake these humans before they reach the stone table. You will know what to do if you find them. I hear and obey, O oh queen, growled the wolf, and immediately he shot away into the snow and the darkness, and as quickly as a horse can gallop, he was gone. In a few minutes he had called another wolf and was with him down on the dam and sniffing the beavers' the house. But of course they found it empty. It would have been a dreadful thing for the beavers and the children that night if they had remained there, for the wolves would have been able to follow their trail and follow them to where they had gone. And ten to one, would have overtaken them before they got to the cave they were in. But now that the snow had begun again, the scent was cold and even the footprints were covered up. Meanwhile, the dwarf whipped up the reindeer and the witch and Edmund drove out under the archway and on and away into the darkness and the cold. This was a terrible journey for Edmund, who had no coat whatsoever. Before they had been going a quarter of an hour, all the front of him was covered with snow. 
He soon stopped trying to shake it off, because as quickly as he did that, a new lot gathered, and he was so tired. Soon he was wet to the skin, and oh, how miserable he was. He didn't look now as if the witch intended to make him a king. All the things he had said to make himself believe that, that she was good and kind, and, and that her side was really the right side, that all sounded silly to him now. He would have given anything to meet the others at this moment, even Peter. The only way to comfort himself now was to try to believe that the whole thing was a dream, that he might wake up at any moment. And as they went on, hour after hour, it did seem quite like a dream. This lasted longer than I could describe, even if I wrote pages and pages about it. But I will skip on to the time when the snow had stopped and the morning had come and they were racing along in the daylight. They still went on and on with no sound but the everlasting swish of the snow and the creaking of the reindeer's harness. And then, at last, the witch says, What have we here? Stop! And they did. How Edmund hoped that she was going to say something about breakfast. But she had stopped for quite a different reason. For a little way, off at the foot of a tree, sat a merry party. A squirrel and his wife and their children, two satyrs and a dwarf and an old dog fox, all on stools around a table. Edmund couldn't quite see what they were eating, but it smelled lovely and there seemed to be decorations of holly. And he wasn't at all sure that, that he didn't see something like a plum pudding, perhaps. At that moment, when the sledge stopped, the fox, who was obviously the oldest person present, had just risen to his feet. Holding a glass in its right paw, as if it was going to say something. But when the whole party saw the sledge stopping, and who was in it, all of the gaiety went out of their faces. The father squirrel stopped eating, with his fork halfway in his mouth, and one of the satyrs stopped, with its fork actually in its mouth, and the baby squirrels squeaked in terror. What's the meaning of this? asked the witch queen. Nobody answered. Speak, you vermin, she answered again, or do you want my dwarf to find you a tongue with his whip? <laughs> what is the meaning of this gluttony, all this waste and self-indulgence? Where did you get all of this? Please, your majesty, said the fox, we were given them, and if I might make so bold as to drink your ma to your majesty's very good health, who gave them to you? said the witch. F -f 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 Father Christmas, stammered the fox. What? roared the witch, springing from the sledge and taking a few strides nearer the animals. He has not been here. He can't have been here. How dare you but say no. Oh, so you have been lying and you shall even now be forgiven. At that moment, one of the young squirrels lost its head completely. No, no, he has, he has, he has, it squeaked, beating its little spoon on the table. Edmund saw the witch bite her lip so as to draw a drop of blood on her white cheek. Then she raised her wand. Oh, don't, oh, don't, please don't, shouted Edmund. But even while he was shouting, she waved her wand and instantly... Where the merry party had been, there were now only statues of creatures. One with its fork, fixed forever halfway into its stone mouth, seated round the table on which their stone plates and their stone plum pudding. As for you, said the witch, giving Edmund a stunning blow to the face as she remounted the sledge. Let that teach you to ask favour of spies and traitors. Drive on! And Edmund, for the first time in this story, felt sorry for someone besides himself. It seemed so pitiful to think that those little stone figures sitting there in the silent days and all of the silent dark nights, year after year, till the moss grew on them, 
and even, even their faces crumbled away. I felt so sorry. Now they were steadily racing on again, and soon Edmund noticed that the snow, which splashed against them, as they rushed through it, was much wetter than it had been last night. At the same time, he noticed that he was feeling much less cold. It was also becoming foggy. In fact, every minute it grew foggier and warmer, and the sledge was not running nearly as well as it had been running up until now. At first he thought this was because the reindeer were tired, but soon he saw that couldn't be the real reason. The sledge jerked and skidded and kept on jolting as it struck against stones. And however the dwarf whipped the poor reindeer, the sledge went slower and slower. There also seemed to be a curious noise all around them, but the noise of their driving and jolting and the dwarf shouting at the reindeer prevented Edmund from hearing what it was until suddenly the sledge stuck so fast it wouldn't go at all. When that happened, there was a moment's silence. And in that silence, Edmund could at last listen to the other noise properly. A strange, sweet, rustling, chattering noise. And yet not so strange, because he's heard it before. If only you could remember where. <laughs> then all at once he did remember. It was the noise of running water. All around them, throughout, throughout their sights, there were streams chattering, murmuring, babbling, splashing, and even in the distance, roaring. And his heart gave a great leap, even though he hardly knew why, when he realised that the frost was over. And, and much nearer, there was a drip, drip, drip from the branches of the trees, and then, as he looked at one tree, he saw a great load of snow slide off for the first time since he had entered Narnia, and he saw the dark green of a fir tree. But he didn't have the time to listen or watch any longer, for the witch said, Don't sit staring, fool! Get out and help! And of course Edmund had to obey. He stepped out onto the snow, but it was really only slush by now, and began helping the dwarf to get the sledge out of the muddy hole that it was into. They got it out at the end, and being very cruel to the reindeer, the dwarf managed to get it on the move again, and they went on a little further. And now the snow was really melting in earnest, and patches of green grass were beginning to peer in every direction. Unless you have looked at the world of snow for as long as Edmund had been looking at it, you will hardly be able to imagine what relief those green patches were after the endless white. But then the sledge stopped again. It's no good, your majesty, said the dwarf. We can't sledge in this thaw. Well, then we must walk, said the witch. We shall never overtake them walking, growled the dwarf. Not with the start that they've got. Are you my counsellor or my slave, said the witch. Do as you're told. Tie the hands of this human creature behind it and keep hold of the end of the rope and take your whip. And cut the harnesses of the reindeer. They'll find their own way home. The dwarf obeyed, and in a few minutes Edmund found himself being forced to walk as fast as he could with his hands being tied behind him. He kept on slipping in the slush, and the mud and the wet grass, and every time he slipped, the dwarf gave him a curse and sometimes a flick of the whip. The witch walked behind the dwarf and kept on saying, Faster! Faster! And every moment the patches of green grew bigger and bigger, and the patches of snow grew smaller. Every moment, more and more, the trees shook off their robes of snow. Soon, wherever you looked, instead of white shapes, you saw dark green firs, or black prickly branches of, bre of bare oaks and beeches and elms. Then the mist turned from white to gold, and presently cleared away altogether. Shafts of delicious sunlight struck down onto the forest floor, and overheard, overhead you could hear the blue sky between the treetops. Soon there was a more wonderful things happening. 
Coming suddenly around the corner into a glade of silver birch trees, Edmund saw the ground covered in all directions with little yellow flowers. The noise of water grew louder too, and presently they actually crossed the stream. Beyond it they found snowdrops growing. Mind your own business, said the dwarf when he saw that Edmund had turned his head to look at them, and he gave the rope a vicious jerk. But of course this didn't prevent Edmund from seeing. Only five minutes later he noticed a dozen crocuses growing around the foot of an old tree, gold, purple and white. And then came the sound even more delicious than the sound of water. Close by, the path where they were following the bird, they suddenly chirped from the branch of a tree. It was answered by the chuckle of another bird a little further off. And then as if that had been a signal, there was a chattering and a chirruping in every direction, and then a moment of full song, and within five minutes the whole wood was ringing with birds' music, and wherever Edmund's eyes turned he saw birds alighting on the branches, or sailing overhead, or chasing one another, or having little quarrels, or tidying up their feathers with their beaks. Faster, faster, said the witch and there was no trace of fog now. The sky became bluer and bluer, and now there was white clouds hurrying across it from time to time. In the wide glades there was a primrose. A light breeze sprang up from which scattered drops of moisture from the swaying branches and carried cool, delicious scents against the faces of the travellers. The trees began to come fully alive. The larches and the birches were covered with green the liburnums with gold. Soon the beech trees had put forth their delicate transparent leaves. As the travellers walked under them, the light also became green. A bee buzzed across the path. This is no Thor, said the dwarf, suddenly stopping. This is spring. What are we going to do? Your winter has been destroyed, Queen. I tell you, this is Aslan's doing. If either of you mentions his name again, said the witch, he shall be instantly killed. Chapter 12. Peter's First Battle While the dwarf and the white witch were saying this, miles away the beavers and the children were walking on half an hour, walking on hour after hour into what seemed a delicious dream. Long ago they had left their coats behind them, and by now they even stopped to say to one another, Look, there's a kingfisher, or, Oh wow, bluebells, or, Isn't that a lovely smell? Or, Just listen to that song thrush. Then they walked on in silence, drinking in this spring, passing through patches of warm sunlight, into cool green thickets and out again into the wide mossy glades where the tall elm trees raised the leafy roof far overhead and then into the dense masses of flowing current and among hawthorn bushes where the sweet smell was almost overpowering. They had been just as surprised as Edmund when they saw the winter vanishing and the whole wood passing a few hours or so from January into May. They hadn't even known for certain, as the witch did, that this is what would happen when Aslan came to Narnia. But they all knew that it was her spells that had produced the endless winter, and therefore they all knew when this magic spring began that something had gone wrong, and badly wrong, with the witch's schemes. And after the thaw had begun, and been going on for some time, they all realised that the witch would no longer be able to use her sledge. After that they didn't hurry so much. They allowed themselves more rests, and longer ones. They were pretty tired by now, of course, but not what I'd call bitterly tired, only slow and feeling dreamy and quiet inside, as one does when one is coming to the end of a long day in the open. Susan had a slight blister on her heel. They had left the course of the big river some time ago, for one that had to turn a little to the right, and that meant a little to the south, 
to reach the place of the stone table. Even in this, this had not been their way. If it, even this had not been their way, they couldn't have kept to the river valley once things began to thaw. For with all of that melting, the snow and the river, well, it would all be in flood, and a wonderful, roaring, thundering yellow flood, and their path would have been underwater. And the sun got low, and the light got redder, and the shadows got longer, and the flowers began to think about closing. Not long now, said Mr. Beaver, as he began leading them uphill, some very deep springy moss, and it felt nice under tired feet, in a place where only the tall trees grew very wide apart. The climb, coming to an end of a long day, made them all pant and feel worn out. And just as Lucy was wondering whether she could even get to the top without another long rest, Suddenly they were at the top, and this is what they saw. They were on the green open space, from which you could look down on the forest, spreading as far as the eye could see in every direction, except right ahead. You see, there, far to the east, was something twinkling and moving. By gum, whispered Peter to Susan, that's the sea. And in the very middle of his open hilltop, was the stone table. It was a great grim slab of grey stone supported on four upright stones. It looked very old and it was cut all over with strange lines and figures that might be letters of an unknown language. They gave you a curious feeling that when you looked at them. The next thing they saw was a pavilion pitched on the side of an open place. The wonderful pavilion it was, and especially now when the light of the setting sun fell on it. With sides of what looked like yellow silk and cords of crimson and tent pegs of ivory, and high above it on a pole banner, which bore the red rampant lion fluttering in the breeze, which was blowing in their faces from far off the sea. While they were looking, at this they heard the sound of music on their right, and turning in any direction, they saw what they had come to see. Aslan stood at the centre of the crowd of creatures who had grouped themselves around him in the shape of a half moon. There was tree women, there were well women, dryads and naiads, as they used to be called in our world, who had stringed instruments. It was they who had made the music. There were four great creatures, the horse, Part of them was like a huge English farm horse, and the main part was like stern, beautiful giants. There was also a unicorn, and a bull with the head of a man, and a pelican, and an eagle, and a great dog. And next to Aslan stood two leopards, of whom one carried his crown, and the other his standard. But as for Aslan himself, the beavers and the children didn't know what to do or say when they saw him. Now, people who have not been in Narnia sometimes think that a thing cannot be good and terrible at the same time. If the children had ever thought so, they were cured of that now. For when they tried to look at Aslan's face, they just caught a glimpse of the golden mane and the great, royal, solemn, overwhelming eyes, and they found they couldn't look at him, and went all trembly. Go on, whispered Mr. Beaver. No, whispered Peter, you first. No, sons of Adam before animals, whispered Mr. Beaver back again. Susan, whispered Peter, what about you? Ladies first? No, 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 you're the, you're the eldest, whispered Susan. And, and of course, the longer they went on doing this, the more awkward they felt. Then at last, Peter realised that it was up to him. He drew his sword and he raised it to the salute and hastily saying to the others, come on, pull yourselves together. And he walked towards the lion and said, we have come, Aslan. Welcome, Peter. Son of Adam, said Aslan, welcome Susan and Lucy, daughters of Eve. Welcome he beaver and she beaver. His voice was deep and rich. 
and somehow took the fidgets out of them. They now felt glad and quiet, and it didn't seem awkward for them to stand and say nothing. But where is the fourth? asked Aslan. Well, he tried to betray them. And join the white witch, O oh Aslan, said Mr. Beaver. And then something made Peter say, Well, that was partly my fault, Aslan. I was angry with him, and I think that helped him go wrong. And Aslan said nothing to either excuse Peter or, or to blame him, but merely stood looking at him with his great unchanging eyes. And it seemed to all of them that there was nothing to be said. Please, Aslan, said Lucy. Can anything be done to save Edmund? All shall be done, said Aslan, but it may be harder than you think. And then he was silent again for some time. Up to that moment, Lucy had been thinking how royal and strong and peaceful his face looked. Now it suddenly came into her, into her head, that he looked sad as well. But the next minute that expression was quite gone. The lion shook his mane and clapped his paws together. Terrible paws, thought Lucy, if he didn't know how to, how, how to velvet them. Meanwhile, let the feast be prepared. Ladies, take these daughters of Eve and to the pavilion and minister to them. When the girls had gone, Aslan laid his paw on Peter's shoulder and said, Come. Son of Adam, I will show you a far-off sight of the castle where you are to be king. And Peter, with his sword still drawn in his hand, went with the lion to the eastern edge of the hilltop. There a beautiful sight met his eyes. The sun was setting behind their backs, and that meant the whole country below them lay in the evening light, the forest hills and the valleys, and winding away like a silver snake, the lower part of the great river. And beyond this, miles away was the sea, and beyond the sea was the sky, full of clouds which were just turning a rose colour with the reflection of the sunset. But just where the land of Narnia met the sea, in fact, at the mouth of the great river, river there was something on the little hill shining. It was shining because it was a castle, and of course the sunlight was reflected from the windows which looked towards Peter and the sunset. But to Peter it looked like a great star resting on the seashore. That, O oh man, said Aslan, is Ker Paravel of the four thrones, in one of which you must sit as king. I show it to you because you are the firstborn and you will be the high king over all of the rest. And once more Peter said nothing, for at that moment a strange noise woke the silence suddenly. It was like a bugle, but richer. It is your sister's horn, said Aslan to Peter in a low voice, so low as to almost be a purr. If it's not disrespectful to think of a lion purring, for a moment Peter didn't understand, and then when he saw all of the other creatures go forward and heard Azan say with a wave of his paw, Back! Let the prince win his spurs! He did understand, and he set off running as hard as he could to the pavilion, and there he saw a dreadful sight. The naiads and the dryads were scattering in every direction. Lucy was running towards him, as fast as her short legs would carry her, and her face was as white as paper. Then he saw Susan make a dash for the tree and swing herself up, followed by a huge grey beast. At first, Peter thought it was a bear. Then he saw it, and it looked like an Alsatian, though it was far too big to be a dog. And then he realised it was a wolf. It was a wolf standing on its hind legs with its front paws against the tree trunk, snapping and star snarling. All of the hair on its back stood up on end. Susan had not been able to get higher than the second branch in the tree. One of her legs hung down so that her foot was only an inch or two above the snapping teeth. Peter wondered why 
she didn't get higher, or at least take a better grip. Then he realised that she was just going to faint, and if she fainted, she would fall off. Peter didn't feel very brave. Indeed, he felt like he was going to be sick. But that didn't make any difference to what he had to do. He rushed straight up to the monster and aimed a slash of his sword at its side. The stroke never reached the wolf. Quick as lightning it turned around, its eyes were flaming and its mouth wide in a howl of anger. If it had not been so angry that it simply had to howl, it would have got him by the throat at once. As it was, though, all this happened too quickly for Peter to think. He had just enough time to duck down and plunge his sword as hard as he could between the brute's forelegs into its heart. Then came a horrible, confused moment, like something in a nightmare. He was tugging and pulling, and the wolf seemed neither alive nor dead, and bared its teeth, knocked against its forehead, and everything was blood and heat and hair. A moment later, he found that the monster lay dead and he had drawn his sword out of it and was straightening his back and rubbing the sweat off his face and out of his eyes. He felt tired all over. But then after a bit, Susan came down from the tree. She and Peter felt pretty shaky, and when they met, I won't say there wasn't kissing and crying on both sides, but in Narnia, no one thinks any the worse of that, well, any, any the worse of you for that. Quick, quick! shouted the voice of Aslan. Centaurs, eagles, I see another wolf in the thicket, there, behind you. He has just darted away. After him, all of you. He will be going to his mistress. Now is your chance, if you find the witch and rescue the fourth son of Anam. And instantly, with thunder of hooves and beating of wings, a dozen or so of the swiftest creatures into the gathering darkness they went. Peter, still out of breath, turned and saw Aslan close at hand. You have forgotten to clean your sword, said Aslan. It was true. Peter blushed when he looked at the bright blade and saw it all smeared with the wolf's hair and blood. He stooped down and wiped it clean on the grass and then wiped it dry on his coat. Hand it to me and kneel, son of Adam, said Aslan. And when Peter had done so, he struck him with the flat of the blade and said, Rise up, Sir F Peter Wolf's Bane. And whatever happens, never forget to wipe your sword. Well, that concludes our reading for this evening. I wonder what's going to happen to all of these kids. I wonder what's going to happen to Edmund and the White Witch. I guess we'll find out next time. Good night, everyone. Well, thanks for joining us. And thank you to HarperCollins Children's Books. As you head into your evening, there's some questions to ponder in the description box below.